Um, with a financial crisis, you know, we have experience. Are we learning? We've let the casino bankers back into their casinos with barely a light slap to their wrists. I would argue we're not learning. Our politicians are incapable of raising, uh, uh, of reining these folks in. With the climate crisis, it's ongoing. You know, we, we do have a majority view favorable, at least in Europe, not in America, but in Europe, of the uncomfortable narrative. And we have successes to point to, like the Cancun Climate Summit in December. But the risk, you know, many of us don't feel it. We, we, we see it as off in the future. Um, you wouldn't if you lived in Queensland. You wouldn't if you lived in, in Russia. And um, Mr. Medvedev totally changed his view after the wildfires in Russia in the summer. Uh, but with the oil crisis, here's the thing. Here's the thing. It's ongoing. The majority view is that there isn't a problem. There's no risk or little risk. Um, the comforting narrative, either explicitly or implicitly, is believed in. And we will find out who's right in the risk assessment. We'll find out within the next few years because as I'll show you in a minute, um, many people believe that this is going to hit um, within the next few years. So, who do we believe? You know, we have two lots of group think. If you go to BP, same thing as Goldman Sachs. Uh, Tony Hayward, who I was a graduate student with at the same time, uh, told me across the boardroom table of BP, Jeremy, this is scaremongering. You know, you're being irresponsible here. These trigger words, the same words that were used against Gillian Tett and others. Um, we just don't believe in it. That's a big word. Belief. You know? We don't believe in it, says the chief economist of BP. We really need to think about the neuroscience of this. He doesn't talk about evidence, he talks about belief. Uh, and on the other hand, you have a front page advert, occasionally a, a, a headline of the kind you see there. And there. It's who do you believe? You know, who do you, who do you follow? Um, the BP type view is the dominant one in governments, boardrooms, in living rooms, implicitly or explicitly. And yet, this is a big high consequence issue in an oil dependent world. If the tankers stop arriving, it'll be a matter of days or weeks at the best before we start really feeling the pinch in the food supply chain, for example, and look at the so-called food crisis of 2000 for that. It's a risk assessment question. Do we believe BP? How is their risk assessment looking these days? <laughs> so a group of us in industry um, don't believe this dominant narrative. Uh, we set up a task force with the breathtakingly original title of the industry task force on peak oil and energy security uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, it was then chaired by Virgin, it's now coordinated by Arab, um, Scottish and Southern, one of the big six are members of it, and my own company, Stagecoach, one or two others, and, and, and big companies are gravitating to this. Kingfisher at BMQ have recently joined, Bureau Happel, the engineering company. And we think, in the two reports that we produced in October 2008, um, we released them on the stock exchange the day after Lehman Brothers went under. No one took any notice for some reason. Uh, and then the second report in February 2010, where Morgan did take notice. This is what we think the boss of the CEOs and the chairman of the big companies. We think it's as bad as the credit card and can descend on us as quickly as the credit crunch. Um, and I'm just going to give you a, just a sort of a snapshot, a top line of the evidence we use. This is an issue where I'm afraid if you really want to form a considered opinion, you're going to have to sit down for a few hours and do some reading. Or if, uh, if you're new to it, forgive me those of you who already are experts in it, uh, to see your way in. But the crucial thing, as I said at the outset, is it's about flow rates. Now, I don't have time to go through these reservoirs of supply and demand, but basically in the big square there, you see you know, what we have in the way of um, reserves and uh, in the silver, so you see the current snapshot or the snapshot at the time this diagram was put together by the task force of consumption. 
most of it in travel, but you know, it's, it's everything. It's um, heating, it's air travel, sea travel, and non fuel <coughs> uses. And the key thing is what you take out of the top tank and put into the bottom tank. And here you see the, um, sorry, the, I need to go back. Uh, here you see the flows um, as they are more or less at the moment, and as they were at the time of uh, the, the production of this diagram. And a little bit bigger now because of rising demand in India and China and the rest. Uh, and you see they're just about match at the moment. But the issue is can they keep, uh, can we keep uh, pumping enough through those constricted pipes to, to fit the, the growing consumption uh, that we're seeing in the circle there. And the key point is that not all of this oil flows as quickly as the industry would like, particularly when it comes to the tar sands. You meet many people who will tell you there are trillions of barrels of oil in the tar sands, and there may be, except there's only one problem. It's not oil, it's tar. Very different. And um, the flow rates out of these are not as the oil industry would like. And here I want to tell you an anecdote to illustrate the nature of our problem. We went to the um, Department of Trade and Industry, as it then was, the industry group, and said, you know, we want to form a government industry task force. We should be working together. And they said, there is no need for this because um, we don't think there's a problem. So we said, well, you may not think that. But you know we do, and others do. So let's do a risk assessment. Uh, and the chief economist at the DTI then said, "No, we're not going to do a risk assessment. That would be too risky." <laughs> <laughs> and we sort of did a bit of a double take and said, "Risky? Why risky? Because if we do a risk assessment, people may think there's risk, and then that may scare people, and the horses may bolt from the stable." So that was that. We talked through the issue. Uh, and at one point, the chief economist said, well, if you're worried about conventional oil, what about non-conventional oil, the tar sands, the point I made just now with the, with the tar? Uh, there's plenty of oil in the tar sands, she said, a big mantra. So we said, um, how much does the government think is the flow rates can be feasibly big, even with massive investment from the tar sands? At that point, she came over all, I'm the chief economist at the Department of Trade and Industry, I don't do detail, and looked at her three junior officials, at which point they all start looking at each other, and we realize they don't know, to within an order of magnitude, what the flow rates are, and potentially are, from the tar sands. And yet, this is a group of people who run energy policy, in the country, and they just accept the mantra that there are trillions of barrels of oil in the tar sands. So that one anecdote gives you a snapshot into a lot of experience these last few years from the task force. So very briefly, peak oil primer. The typical production profile of a single field looks like this. You go up, you go down, there's a peak in the middle. Oil fields occur in provinces like the North Sea. They stack up together. You tend to find the biggest fields first. So you see the production profile there um, of stacked fields. It's a you know, notional stack. The, the um, peak production is typically 30% you know, of the way into um, the total reserve being extracted. And here's a very important, very important point. There are 70,000 producing oil fields in the world. But 50% of them, um, uh, the 50% of the production comes from just over 100 of these giant, super giant fields, and they're mostly old now. Uh, and there tends to be 10, uh, 20 to 40 years between the peaks of production and discovery. And get this, the peak of discovery was so long ago that it was before England last won the World Cup of Soccer. So, ought this to be a, uh, a little bit of a concern for us? Um, I would argue yes. Um, the North Sea looks like this, if you will stay still, Mr. Slide. 
Um, and here we see real data. You see the pattern, though, very clearly portrayed. The big fields are found first, and the fields get smaller and smaller. The peak of production was around the turn of the century. Now, BBC Scotland succeeded in showing a whole one-hour documentary on how Scotland was going to be the Kuwait of the oil industry without ever once mentioning that the North Sea had long since gone over the peak of production. And again, an anecdote that shows you know, the sort of mantras, the belief systems that are work, at work here, the absence of, of data. Um, the whole North Sea has well over the peak, same with Norway. And if you look at the global pattern, why um, 48 countries, uh, more than 48 now, are over the peak. Um, and here you see them all stacked up. So if that's the pattern for so many oil-producing countries, what's the global pattern going to be? We would argue, given here um, the pattern of past discovery, you see the peak back in the 1960s, the descent, no matter what you hear about, you know, the hype about big oil fields found off Brazil, and they are big oil fields, look at the global pattern. Where are we headed? So we worry in the, uh, the industry task force on um, a number of points. The way that discovery of giant oil fields, given the importance of them, is collapsing. The way they themselves, being so old, can collapse. And for the aficionados, um, there's a big oil field in Mexico, Cantarell, which is a spectacular example here. The flash to bang time. You go out tomorrow and find an oil field. It's six to seven years before you can bring the oil to market. Bigger fields, it's more. Uh, and the flow rates, we see the flow rates falling in the reported discoveries of oils from, or oil from 2013 onwards. This is why we're worried, ladies and gentlemen. Now, the oil industry, some of my mates from BP were here, they'd say, Jeremy's scaremongering again, it's all um, irresponsible stuff, just like they did with the people warning about the credit crunch. Enhanced oil recovery, EOR, they say, is going to come to our rescue. But this only slows the production drop, it seems to us. And then we worry about reserves that are being quoted by the OPEC countries, and here we have to you know, worry about polite terminology. We call them phantom reserves. Other people would use less polite language. We think there's political declaration of reserves, and we talk about that in our reports. So we think that the peak of production is imminent, that it will fall against expectation of future production, and that this will hit our oil-dependent economies, national, local, very hard. What about the other?